evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is, uh, what I'm about to do, of course, is to close this meeting effectively. Um, this is sometimes known as the last lap, sometimes known as the graveyard slot. Um, I can't complain because, in fact, I volunteered myself for this one, being one of the organizers of the meeting and the program. Um, but anyhow, here we are. I'm impressed at how many of you are still here. It's been a fantastic series of talks, I must say. Um, and I feel very privileged to have heard some of the things I've heard. The bar is set very high. Now, um, in contrast to quite a bit of what we've heard before, I'm not going to be discussing big clinical trial data. The main reason for that is that we in renal medicine are not very good at that sort of study. Um, and um, so I can't compete uh, with what we've heard before on that level. Uh, and in fact, it's slightly ironic in some ways that one of the earliest and best really large clinical trials done in nephrology was led by a cardiologist, um, actually one who's here um, by name Dr. Mark Pfeffer. Um, and so that's a little uh, side of sobering uh, uh, observation for us in renal medicine, that it takes cardiologists to come and do good studies in our field. Uh, John McMurray is also involved currently with uh, one or two others in the renal field as well. Um, so I think we have a certain amount to learn. So I'm not going to go there because um, others will have done it better already. Um, what I am going to do, though, is um, uh, address a topic that will be familiar to quite a number of the nephrologists here, of whom there are not that many. So I'm really going to focus more on the, uh, those of you who are cardiologists and uh, uh, are metabolic doctors and diabetologists. Um, I'll jump over that one quickly. Now, here's a short clinical vignette. <coughs> this is a game called rugby. Um, uh, and this gentleman here uh, is a man called Jonah Lomu, who was a feared, a brilliant New Zealand rugby player. Now, he's the equivalent in rugby of Pele here. Uh, he was a dominant figure uh, in the sport, uh, a huge man, massive athlete, um, and uh, ran the 100 meters in 10 seconds, uh, weighed an enormous amount of money. You would not wish to stand between him and somewhere where he was trying to go. Uh, this is a poor Englishman. Uh, who's trying and failing to stop him, uh, 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 scoring a try. Now, the story, though, um, is interesting and a little sad. So this is a short life with renal disease. This man was born in 1975. Between the ages of 19 and 27, he played international rugby for New Zealand. He was the youngest person ever to represent his country in rugby, 63 caps and scored 37 tries, which are, for those of you who don't know the game, 37 touchdowns. Um, so that's quite a career. In parallel with that sporting career, this was going on on the medical side. When he was 20, he developed nephrotic syndrome, had a kidney biopsy which showed a condition called focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis, FSGS. Now, this is a nasty form of glomerulonephritis. It's nasty because it causes a serious nephrotic syndrome. It tends to progress uh, very often to end-stage renal disease. And the only treatments that work uh, are quite toxic and include high-dose steroids. And he was indeed treated with high-dose steroids. And for most of his rugby career, he was receiving prednisolone at substantial dose, which is uh, quite interesting to contemplate what he would have been like had he not been uh, ill. And he had progressive loss of kidney function. Finally ended up with end-stage renal disease, dialysis. Uh, then he got a kidney transplant. This disease recurs in transplant kidneys sometimes. That's the other problem with it. It recurred in his kidney back onto dialysis with end-stage renal disease. All pretty dire. Uh, and then, at the age of 40, dropped dead. Um, so a sad story, um, but one that in the renal world we see quite a bit of, um, sudden death uh, in the renal patient. Um, so one asks oneself, what's going on here? Uh, now, nephrologists in the audience will all have seen this uh, uh, figure uh, many times over. Uh, so observational data <coughs> taken from the USRDS uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, 20 years ago, looking at annual mortality rate in uh, <coughs> uh, normal subjects, males and female, uh, and in hemodialysis patients. This is the log scale on the vertical axis. And the relative risk of death when you're young of having renal disease on hemodialysis is about 100-fold a massive increase in relative risk. It diminishes somewhat as you get older because the denominator uh, increases, of course. But even so, there is a huge additional burden of mortality uh, if you are a hemodialysis patient, um, such that a dialysis patient in their 
between the age of 25 and 34 has life expectancy of a healthy 85-year-old. So this is pretty terrible. Um, most of the dialysis patients don't actually realize that, but this is a fact. Uh, it's more dangerous than most cancers. We were talking earlier on about boasting about my disease is more dangerous than your disease. Well, my disease is more dangerous than most oncologists' disease, certainly. Um, and most of these uremics are dying of cardiovascular disease. That's by far the biggest cause of this premature death. So this is a bad scenario. And you ask yourself, what's going on here? Um, now, one of the things that's going on in the hemodialysis scenario, of course, is that what we're giving these patients is a very second-rate therapy. Uh, this is a poor substitute for uh, normal renal function. Uh, the delivered clearance by hemodialysis, if you work it out on a per-week basis, comes through at about 10 ml per minute. So this is CKD stage 5 uh, and quite severe CKD stage 5. So in terms of clearing correcting the uremic syndrome chemically, it's very poor. Dialysis do, do, is a very poor treatment for the volume issues in, in uh, uh, renal failure. It does nothing on the metabolic side um, uh, and uh, <coughs> altogether is very second rate. Uh, but the problem is that this uh, phenomenon of accelerated mortality uh, is also seen before you get to dialysis. And if you look at <coughs> uh, the hazard ratio of a cardiovascular event in relation to GFR, starting off with essentially normal renal function here uh, and moving down to GFR less than 15, you can see that there's a big dose effect uh, uh, in terms of the hazard ratio of a cardiovascular event as you lose kidney function. So this is not just confined to dialysis with all the uh, abnormal abnormalities imposed by that treatment. This is also the case when your GFR is diminishing. And this immediately emphasizes the importance of trying to make sure that you protect GFR as well as you possibly can to avoid cardiovascular events. Now, we in the renal world uh, tend to look at the relationship between the kidney and the heart like this. Uh, and we know that this is really the dominant force um, and that the heart, to be able to flourish, has to have a decent kidney behind it. Um, and I would like that to be the main message of my talk here uh, is look after the kidneys. But let's just consider what is going wrong in the circulation in the typical patient with uh, uh, advancing renal failure. So we start off on the left-hand side, um, <coughs> looking at the heart itself. We end up with a heart um, that uh, has a considerable degree of myocardial fibrosis. Uh, the vent left ventricle may well, uh, uh, it'll certainly be a hypertrophied, may well dilate with the congestive cardiomyopathy picture, vascular calcification, uh, conventional atheromatous disease, and considerable electrical instability and arrhythmias uh, uh, resulting in a heart like this. And that's probably uh, the, what underlies much of the sudden death, which indeed seems to be the dominant cause of cardiac death in these patients, uh, sudden arrhythmic death. Um, atherosclerosis is a big contributor, but it's, it's not the major one. So that's going on in the heart. But if we then look at the vasculature, uh, we obviously have uh, a standard atherosclerosis, but we have uh, a massive increase in vascular calcification with extremely extreme stiffening of the vasculature, very high pulse wave velocity, uh, and the conventional things that affect all the patients we've been talking about. So that if we then look at a patient who's, or a group of patients tracking from left to right, so advanced renal disease out here, uh, uh, normal renal function here, and look at the burden of pathology that develops in these patients. So there is, as kidney function goes downhill, a steady increase in what one would call the conventional uh, type of vascular pathology, leading to uh, coronary artery disease, ischemic strokes, uh, peripheral arterial disease, increasing steadily, but then beyond about CKD3, not really changing a great deal. The big changes occur here with non-atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the LVH, the arrhythmias I've talked about, sudden death, calcification, arterial calcification, valvular calcification, hemorrhagic stroke. So these ones just continue to rise steadily and quite steeply as the GFR goes down. So this is a pattern that's somewhat different uh, from that, that seen in the non-renal patients. The vascular calcification is highly prevalent in these patients and of very, of very severe degree. Um, and this was first uh, noted uh, documented properly back in the 1990s when electron beam CT uh, uh, as a new technique uh, became available. That was before conventional CT scanners could image coronary arteries properly. So EBCT was used in these early studies. 
and showed, first of all, that the coronary artery calcium score um, had an age dependence. Well, there's no surprise there. Um, if we look at patients who are, uh, have no coronary artery disease and no renal disease, uh, their scores remain extremely low in general um, uh, throughout life. Look at those with documented coronary disease, and there's an age-related increase. These are the brown bars here. Uh, again, not surprising. But the dialysis patients are way off the scale here, uh, generating huge numbers for coronary artery calcification. And the anatomy of this calcification is largely medial rather than intimal. So there's a somewhat different pathology. Um, it has a major bearing on survival. Um, and again, observational data showing uh, 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 survival here, there's a hierarchy related to the severity of coronary artery calcification, um, and uh, this is again in dialysis patients, and a big penalty if you have high levels of coronary artery calcium. In parallel with that, almost superimposable, are changes in pulse wave velocity. Now, I'm going to come back to the notion shortly that uh, having uremia is, in fact, a, a state of accelerated aging. And we all know that as we're getting older, our pulse wave velocity is getting faster, that the renal patients are uh, running ahead of the game, as it were. Uh, and that is very much to uh, put them at great risk. And these very high pulse wave velocities are associated with an enormous uh, penalty in terms of survival. Now, the vascular calcification, um, when I was at medical school and as a young doctor, I assumed that this was all to do with a high calcium phosphorus product, as seen in advanced uremia. These patients cannot excrete phosphate properly, calcium phosphorus product very high. I and the people who taught me largely, I think, thought this was a straight physico-chemical phenomenon, um, a precipitation of the vessels, but it's not. Um, that's a bit of it, but most of it is actually cell-mediated. Um, and is driven by a, a change in phenotype of the vascular smooth muscle cells to cells that are somewhat more like osteoblasts than bone-forming cells uh, and express osteoblast-type genes, osteopontin, uh, uh, matrix glial protein, and fetuin. These are actually quite useful. These are inhibitors of calcification, uh, 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 but also um, express other things like um, osteocalcin, alkaline phosphatase, uh, uh, they, they acquire the machinery to form, to calcified, to form calcified tissue. So movement this way in the uremic, uremic environment is highly disadvantageous, leading to this cell-mediated uh, uh, transdifferentiation, um, which is accelerated by high phosphate, amongst other things, which is uh, uh, the norm in patients with advanced kidney disease, uh, sometimes accelerated further when we doctors give too much supplementary active vitamin D, uh, uh, and a high calcium phosphorus product, all pushing it that way. Um, it's very hard to move this back, um, and there are no really effective interventions to accelerate reversal of that process. If we look at the hormonal and metabolic changes that accompany progressive uremia, we, and the potential impact of these on the vasculature, we see something like this. So here, GFR again, normal on the left-hand side, dropping down to a uh, near end stage here. Um, and the things I've looked at, FGF23, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, parathyroid hormone, sclerostin, which you may not know a great deal about, and phosphate, obviously. <coughs> 125-dihydroxy-D, that's the active form of vitamin D, and clotho. Um, and as you lose GFR, you go through a phase of what I call a series of adaptive responses. Now, phosphate stays normal, despite the fact that serum that uh, excretory capacity is diminishing steadily. Phosphate stays normal until fairly late in the day, till the GFR is down around 20 or 30. Uh, it stays normal because PTH rises uh, and promotes phosphaturia. So there's an adaptive response that is protecting us from severe hyperphosphatemia in the, in the face of declining GFR. FGF23, fibroblast growth, growth factor 23, is a, is a bone source protein. This is the skeleton as an endocrine organ. Uh, it's a peptide. It acts on phosphate handling in the kidney in the same way that PTH does. It's a very important regulator of phosphate homeostasis. It rises very early on, and early on, you could argue, is part of an adaptive response protecting us from what would happen if serum phosphate rose too far too fast. Calcium trial levels go down. This is the failing kidney not making enough active vitamin D. There are other things at play that contribute to that. 
Clotho uh, going down steadily from a very early point, uh, and sclerostin here, which I'll talk about in a minute, rising. The notion I just want to sow in your mind at the moment is that these responses are potentially adaptive and beneficial early on, but may become maladaptive later on, especially at the enormously high levels of things like FGF23 that develop in these patients. Um, uh, uh, there's the potential for off-target effects uh, that will be counterproductive. The result of all this is that you end up with this sort of metabolic mayhem um, uh, at the end of the day when you come to the end of those curves on the right-hand side. So <clears throat> this is the end game in the untreated patient. We have urine creatinine raised, phosphates high, calcium low. N these patients are usually deficient of native vitamin D. They're very deficient of the active form of vitamin D. They have secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, and these things have been the focus of the management we throw at these patients. Uh, with either dialysis, with various forms of dialysis, uh, uh, and with active vitamin D. We can often control phosphate quite well, we can control calcium, we can give native vitamin D, we can give calcitriol. That's all easy, relatively so, and we can limit the rise of parathyroid hormone in that way. As I said, dialysis comes in here, but doesn't do a very good job. Um, but nevertheless, all those things are potential targets for treatment that we use the whole time. Um, uh, uh, and we like to think that this is going to lead to improvements in cardiovascular outcomes. Now, why do we think that? Because many of these things, calcium, calcitriol, phosphate, uh, and PTH, associate in large observational studies with adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So the sort of scenario snapshot we see here is almost a full house of risk factors, metabolic risk factors for cardiovascular disease, as judged by many large observational studies. The problem we've got in nephrology is that in studies that have been done, even when they're very successful in terms of controlling these uh, 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 surrogates here, none, I repeat none, have shown a, uh, uh, a clear-cut, statistically uh, robust improvement in patient-level outcomes, survival particularly. So there's a big disconnect between all this stuff going on here, the metabolic mayhem, um, and um, what actually happens when we correct it with treatment. So it begs the question, I haven't uh, mentioned these three down here yet, um, and um, uh, I'm going to, uh, why is that, uh, I'm pressing the wrong one, there we are. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to spend a little time talking about FGF 23, a particular little, even less about clotho, and then a bit about sclerostin. Now, these are things that are clearly very abnormal um, in the uremic environment, but we do not have effective treatments for these at all. Uh, so why am I concerned about this? Well, let's have a word about FGF23, first of all. This is a bone-derived peptide hormone. Um, it's uh, uh, the uh, main signal for increasing the secretion of FGF23 is raised, raised extracellular phosphate concentration. Uh, <coughs> And uh, its principal actions are on sodium handling in the proximal tubule uh, to decrease, phosph decrease phosphate reabsorption and thereby promote phosphate excretion. That's all fairly straightforward stuff. Uh, it's also a very powerful down regulator of the production of calcitriol in the kidney. So it reduces the activation of the vitamin D endocrine system uh, and promotes phosphaturia. Both those two tend to decrease serum phosphate. So it's an important regulator of phosphate homeostasis. Um, uh, <coughs> now, why is there the interest in this? Well, again, observational studies um, have shown that if we look at the right-hand side, just stick over on this side here, don't worry about all this, look at the right-hand side, have shown that if you look in patients on hemodialysis at FGF23 and look at the effect of the association between FGF23 levels and uh, risk, you see an incredibly steep dose response here almost a 600% uh, difference between the uh, highest quartile and the lowest quartile. So this is massive. No other potential biomarker in renal medicine comes close to that. Um, uh, this is really quite remarkable. Now, of course, it begs the question, uh, what if we were able to reduce FGF23 down to here? Could we achieve this reduction? Well, we all know from bitter experience and having had our fingers burnt many times, uh, that that is not necessarily going to happen. But it's very enticing as a prospect. There's a terrifically powerful association being shown many times over. LVH in patients 
uh, uh, with renal disease, again, very much dependent on the level of GFR, uh, and the prevalence increases steadily uh, as GFR goes down. Um, and that is also associated with progressive increase of FGF23. So again, four quartiles uh, of um, uh, FGF23 um, uh, predicting left ventricular mass index. So in a sense, there's a parallel relationship there. Uh, as GFR goes down, FGF23 rises, and uh, LVH uh, uh, increases. Would it be a good thing to inhibit that FGF23? Not clear. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, experimental studies done mainly by Miles Wolfe and colleagues, but there are many others, uh, have shed s s some light on this. So these are studies in rats uh, with experimental CKD. Uh, <coughs> these are the sham animals. Uh, these are 5, 6 nephrectomy. So these are uremic rats with severe uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, largely blocked by the addition of an antagonist, an FGF23 receptor antagonist. So looking quite hopeful there. Um, uh, and, and quite strong uh, evidence, I think, for a, a genuine cause and effect relationship between FGF23 and LVH. There's obviously more to that story. Now, a quick word about alpha clotho. Now, why is this important in relation to FGF23? Well, it, it exists in a transmembrane form as well as a soluble form, but that transmembrane form is a co-receptor for FGF23. Um, and I'm not going to go through all these other things uh, uh, in relation to clotho in the interest of time, um, except to say that syndromes of clotho deficiency are associated with accelerated aging, um, uh, and be they genetically determined or acquired. And renal disease is a state of clotho deficiency. And there are considerable phenotypic, si phenotypic similarities, uh, particularly the accelerated aging between genetic alpha clotho uh, ablation and chronic kidney disease. So this may be part of the pathogenesis of this aging that we're seeing. But if we look then at how FGF23 and uh, clotho fit together, here's FGF23 being released from bone. And here is, on the, is the sort of what I would call the classic uh, phosphate-related relationship with FGF23. FGF23 promoting phosphaturia. Uh, it's also in, in inhibiting the production of 125. 125 stimulates FGF23. There's a negative feedback loop there. There's another negative feedback loop here between 125 and PTH. So this is, the, as it were, the hormonal control of vitamin D uh, and phosphate. But FGF23 goes to these very, very high levels. And there's this suggestion from the associated, associative data uh, that there may be some collateral damage, as it were, in the form of progression of CKD, LVH, and a range of other things, including endothelial dysfunction, vascular stiffness, and uh, uh, certainly associating and predicting early demise. So uh, we have these sort of two scenarios. This is the physiological one, which can become pathological. And this one here is purely pathological um, and potentially seen when FGF23 is very high. Now, if we try and put that together with the Clotho story, uh, we've got this. We've got these kidney effects, which also, I'm not going to talk about FGF23 and the parathyroids. The kidney effects require Clotho as the cofactor co for FGF23 action. So this FGF23 will only act on the kidney in the presence of Clotho. Um, we have the cardiac ones, which I showed you a short while ago with those rat studies. These are Clotho independent um, and are blockable with FGF23 uh, receptor blockers. And then over here, we have direct effects of clotho, which are FGF23 independent. Um, these are antioxidant, in some respects vaso vasoprotective, inhibit calcification, and promote phosphaturia. Remember, clotho is diminished in CKD. So these, this whole uh, area here may well be uh, um, uh, inhibited. Now, a quick word about sclerostin. Um, now, sclerostin is a bone-derived glycoprotein. Uh, um, and the important things about sclerostin is basically an inhibitor of the Wnt signaling pathway. And for people like me interested in the skeleton, it's important because it's an important regulator of osteoblastic bone formation. Uh, now, if you inhibit it, um, and that can be done now, there's a therapy actually on the market, uh, romosozumab, uh, which is an antibody that inhibits sclerostin, and that's a treatment for osteoporosis. It's actually a very effective treatment for osteoporosis, uh, which is now actually also licensed uh, in some countries now. Um, 
It's elevated in patients with chronic kidney disease, um, uh, which contributes to the bone disease of patients with chronic kidney disease. And the vascular effects of sclerostin, uh, which I say is largely skeletal, but is also made in the vascular, synthesized in the vascular wall to a small extent as well. These are unpredictable and not fully understood, but I'm going to endeavor to say a little bit more about this before I finish. Um, so here's the, um, the Wnt pathway um, in its physiological form here. Here's Wnt uh, binding to LRP56 uh, with frizzled uh, uh, transmembrane protein, protein here, uh, increases beta catenin and leads to a variety of effects following translocation to the, to the nucleus, depending on the cell type we're talking about. Uh, these effects include increasing bone formation and decreasing bone resorption. Um, so uh, uh, th this uh, uh, activation of this pathway is inhibitable physiologically by various uh, endogenous uh, substances here, including sclerostin, which gets in on the act here, prevents Wnt from getting at the receptor, um, and that results um, in a reduction of osteoblastogenesis and an increase in osteoclastogenesis. And this is the, therefore the sort of thing that we do not want to see, and we unfortunately, do see in CKD. So if we put this together with the vasculature now, I'm sorry this is a bit complex. I'll try and just get you through this one <coughs> reasonably painlessly. So here we have uh, uh, a damaged kidney. We know that sclerostin rises in CKD, and so, do, so also does DICOF-1, the um, uh, <coughs> other uh, uh, decoy receptor. Um, we know that in the skeleton in CKD, we have a state of adynamic bone disease very often where essentially nothing much is happening. Bone cells are inactive, uh, osteoblasts are quiet, osteoclasts are quiet, the bone is usually mechanically poor, and it cannot act as a calcium and phosphate buffer. It's largely inert. So one of its important physiological functions uh, uh, is seriously compromised. So we have too much scleros sclerostin around. Um, so, uh, <coughs> If we were then to, to uh, uh, block that by giving this uh, uh, antibody, romosozumab, for example, that would be rather good for the skeleton, and it is indeed good for the skeleton. It really, really works incredibly well. It might be a different story in the vasculature, though, because here sclerostin potentially um, is actually, uh, and there's some evidence here, uh, that sclerostin is an inhibitor of calcification in the vasculature. So if you come along with romosozumab, there's the potential to do considerable harm there. And indeed, the... Early studies, I say the earlier, the phase two and three studies with ROMO uh, did raise some concerns. There were some weak signals on the vascular side that caused some delay uh, in the progression of this stuff to the market. And there is a theoretical basis for that. So I put a question mark there, um, but the stuff is through. Uh, we're not giving this to renal patients at the moment. Uh, whether we do in the future, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but the adynamic bone and the vascular calcification here are all... Uh, likely contributors to mortality. So to finish then, this is where we are. We have the patient level outcome sitting here in the middle. This is what's proved so intractable uh, to us in the renal world. Um, cardiovascular disease, fractures, and mortality. Around the outside, we've got things that we are going wrong that we can define quite clearly, vascular calcification, uh, metabolic bone disease, uh, and a whole host of laboratory abnormalities, which are quite spectacular. Uh, and many of which we can correct, but not all of which we can correct, uh, as I've said before. So things like sclerostin, we have no idea how to go about correcting that um, other than to give romosozumab with its potential uh, 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 side effects. Lowering FGF23, uh, attractive in principle, uh, but potentially very dangerous. Studies in CKD rats where an antibody to FGF23, uh, borosumab, have been given have resulted in premature death. They get a highly calcifying uh, scenario and die uh, uh, faster when you inhibit FGF23. So this is not straightforward at all. Uh, these things here, we can't treat uh, clotho deficiency. Uh, 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 there's no prospect at the moment. So this is the rather grisly scenario that we have. So the question is then, interventions that we can make, we can improve the numbers uh, in some cases, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, these abnormal numbers associate with adverse outcomes. Big question mark as to whether the interventions uh, can be made to improve these outcomes, not so far uh, by and large. Um, so how are we going to avoid that happening? Well, I think what we've just got to do is protect this chap here on the right, uh, 
Um, and if we can keep this in good working order, uh, we can probably look after most of the interests of the heart as well. If the kidneys are in trouble, the heart is in big trouble. So look after your kidneys. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.